Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. The text for our sermon today comes to us from the Gospel of St. Mark in the ninth chapter. Now one of the most famous doctors of the early church was a man named John. John of Antioch. A rather common first name and actually No last name, just a reference to the city in Syria where he was born. But this John was far from common. Born in the year of our Lord, 347, he prepared for a career in law under a renowned teacher. A teacher who marveled indeed at his pupil's eloquence and foresaw a brilliant career for him as a statesman and a lawgiver. But at the age... Of 23. Imagine that at the age of 23 he was studying law. Well, John learned about Jesus Christ. John was baptized. John abandoned the law in favor of service to our Savior. And from the pulpit there emerged a preacher whose oratorial excellence gained him a reputation throughout the Christian world. His popularity earned him election as the Patriarch of Constantinople. And from there he launched a crusade, a crusade against excessiveness and greed amongst the members of the church. Empress Eudoxia took this as a personal affront to her and to her royal court. And this gave rise then to sinister forces that envied his tremendous influence, that accused him of treason and plotted his exile. But the people rose to his defense with such a clamor that the royalty and those envious clergy had no choice but to relent, and John was restored. His sermons, his letters... His theological treaties, his liturgical works, his biblical commentaries, they were so great that when he died, John was given a last name. John Chrysostomos, or you might know him as John Chrysostom. That Greek word means golden mouth. And his feast day, January 27th, is noted in, in our Lutheran hymnal as we rejoice that God would raise up one so eloquent, so capable to illuminate the Word of God. And speaking of illumination, well, today is the transfiguration of our Lord. It is the final Sunday after Epiphany, and that most wondrous manifestation of our Lord's glory, indeed the most wonderful in all of Holy Scripture. It's really the culmination, you see, of everything that began with the birth of Christ on Christmas. Now concerning the transfiguration, the Apostle John ties it to the Lord's birth. He says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, speaking of Christmas. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so John takes us then to today, to the transfiguration. Now Peter refers to the transfiguration in his epistle as well. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the, mag- by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And even though he lived several centuries later, St. John Chrysostom claimed this mountaintop experience for himself, and indeed every Christian can join with him in those words that this famous doctor of the church put forth. A strange and most glorious mystery do I see. Now when Jesus led Peter, James, and John up on the high mountain by themselves, what is it that they saw? Our gospel says, He was transfigured before them, 
and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now we can only imagine what it must have been like for those chosen three to see their friend Jesus literally glowing from his face and his body so that even his clothes could not dull the brightness that was the sight they would never forget. And then, and then to see him conversing with Moses and Elijah in their glorified state was really for them a foretaste of all the hope that would culminate in their affiliation with Jesus. Now Moses, because of his own disobedience, died in the wilderness of Sinai without crossing the Jordan into the promised land. Moses, this giver of the law, signifies by his death in the wilderness that no one, not even Moses, can be justified before God by the works of the law. And yet, here is Moses, glorified in heaven with the Messiah, of whom he also prophesied to the children of Israel, saying, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horb on the day of assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And there was Elijah, the reformer of old who restored Israel to the true worship of the true God. And Elijah was swept away from this world in a flaming chariot, signifying for us that salvation, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, is in the coming Christ alone. And this is truly everything the disciples hoped for in the Lord Jesus. And so it's little wonder that Peter cries out with inexpressible joy. He says, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. But then something happened that changed that exuberance. A cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Now in the account in, in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 17, he adds, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Now what would turn their joy into fear? Well, the same thing was experienced by the prophet Isaiah when he came into the bare presence of God. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, even though the believer longs, for such close communion with God on this side of heaven, we still carry with us the flesh of the old fallen Adam. And that old Adam fears this encounter with God. Remember how our first parents felt when they chose to follow the word of the serpent instead of the word of God. And the eyes of both were opened, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. The Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, and I hid myself. Man, as he is in his nature, has been hiding in fear of God ever since. 
children of Israel in the wilderness feared the sight of God as He appeared in the pillar of fire. They feared His thunderous voice coming down from heaven. And as great as the prophet Isaiah was, fear overcame Him before the bare majesty of the holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. As great as the disciples were, when the bare voice of God the Father thundered from heaven, fear overtook them on the mountain of transfiguration. But as quickly as that thunderous voice from heaven made them fall on their faces and cower in fear, just so quickly it was over. Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. What had changed exactly? That they were no longer afraid. Moses and Elijah were no longer seen, though their words were still well known to the disciples. The thunderous voice was no longer heard, even though the words of that voice were still fresh in their minds. And Jesus was still there with them, no longer transfigured. But to be sure, it was the same Jesus, whom they now knew without a doubt to be God's beloved Son, with whom God the Father was well pleased. And indeed, this Jesus, whom they should fear, excuse me, whom they should hear. In a way, really, nothing had changed. But then they knew now for certain that behind the veil was everything that they had hoped for. And even though now they saw no one but Jesus only in the humble form with which he took upon himself, they could say in the words of that golden-mouthed preacher John Chrysostom, a strange and most glorious mystery do I see. Now John Chrysostom, in, in Pauline fashion, he takes this transfiguration of Jesus a step further, and he applies it to us. He understands that in this, in this life, our mortal, eyes, our mortal eyes cannot gaze upon the divine majesty. Even in the transfiguration, the disciples were given only a glimpse of the Lord's full divinity. As Chrysostom says, even then, he did not display to us all the splendor of the world to come. But at that time on the mountain, he disclosed to them as much as was possible for them to see, as much as was possible that they could take in without injuring the sight of these beholders. And even so, they could not endure it, but fell upon their faces. If we think of the great cathedrals of the church, with their towering arches, reaching up to heaven, as it were, adorned with magnificent works of Christian art, with the boom of pipe organs, with choirs that are always echoing that great holy, holy, holy of the seraphim, constructed as places of splendor where people could go for just such a mountaintop experience to get a glimpse of the world to come, a glimpse without blinding them, but still causing them to fall to their knees. For this, for this the people gathered in these magnificent structures. And long before the service would begin, not to visit with their friends, as though the church was a kind of social hall, and not to and not to gather and ruckus themselves, but indeed actually to pray, to be humbled, to meditate upon those profound mysteries of Christ, of heaven, of their own salvation and glorification before the throne of God through the merits of our Lord and our Savior. And then, and then the divine liturgy would start with the church's own culture of mystical images, mystical gestures and sounds that adorn the Word of God that would lead them from the depths of sin and death, made ever clear by the thundering voice of the law, 
Lead them then to the altar of grace where Jesus would come and touch them and say, Rise, have no fear. And when they would lift up their eyes, they would see no one but Jesus only. The high point of the transfiguration was not the glorious vision which sent the disciples falling on their faces. It was when Jesus once again veiled himself and touched them with his humanity and comforted them by removing their fear. For from here, Jesus will go directly to the cross where he will die and take away the reason for all fear. And the same is true of the divine service of the church. The high point isn't the law of Moses thundering away in the Old Testament, nor is it the exhortation of Elijah and all the apostles and prophets calling us to reform our lives and heed the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. No, this is all necessary, but the high point the high point of the divine service is when Jesus veils himself again in simple bread and simple wine. And he touches you and says, Do not be afraid. Take, eat my body, drink my blood, given and shed on the cross for the forgiveness of of all your sins. Veiled he is in his word and sacrament. But when Jesus veils himself and his glory, you are being glorified by him. His transfiguration begins to grow within you, and you are becoming the new creation which he has become for your sake by taking upon himself our flesh. And this is what John, that golden mouth Chrysostom, meant when he said, A strange and most glorious mystery do I see. His life was one of persecution and suffering. Yet for the sake of Jesus' suffering, he confessed this glorious transfiguration awaiting all believers. As St. Paul says, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so hear the words of John Chrysostom. Behold now the sky, and pass through it in thought to the region beyond the sky, and consider the transfiguration to take place in the whole creation. For it will not continue to be such as it is now, but will be far more brilliant and beautiful. Just as gold glistens more brightly than lead, so will the future constitution of the universe be better than the present. It will in the future be itself also transfigured into the nobler condition. Nowhere in that world will there be sedition or strife. For great is the concord of the band of saints all being ever in harmony with one another. It is not possible there to fear the devil and the plots of demons or the threatenings of hell or death, either the death which now is or the other death which is far worse than this. But every terror of this kind will have been done away with. And just as some royal child who has been brought up in mean guise and subject to fear and threats, lest he should deteriorate and become unworthy of his paternal inheritance, as soon as he has attained the royal dignity, immediately exchanges all his former raiment for the purple robe and the royal crown, and assumes his state with much confidence, having cast out of his soul thoughts of humility and subjection. Even so will it happen then, to all the saints. Shall we then, I ask, deprive ourselves of such great blessings in order to avoid suffering for a brief period? Hear what the blessed Peter says. 
It is good for us to be here. It is indeed good for us to be here. For here, a strange and most glorious mystery do we see. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.